I love Star Trek, which is why I hate bad Star Trek. And here we are at episode 80, and it's time for another top 10 list. What do you say, Kim? Do you think it's time to talk about the decline of Star Trek? I think we're ready to take this on. Now it's time for Voyager. But the top 10 best of Voyager. What can I say about Voyager? It could have been amazing. It could have been the greatest Star Trek ever, but it really wasn't willing to try anything new and just stayed where it was safe and comfortable and repetitive and was the worst of what Star Trek had to offer. In a part of space where there are a few rules, it's more important than ever that we hold fast to our own. And it just went downhill from there until it finally bled into Enterprise. Was it something I said? Still, as I said, we're not here to talk about the bad, we're here to talk about the good. And the way I make it sound, I make it sound like Voyager some cartoonishly stupid thing. So without any further ado, here is the top 10 Voyager episodes. Oh, come on! It's the thrill of one more kill, the last one to fall. We never sacrifice their will. Oh, never go to your back when the world calls in vain. They only attack with your wings on the wind. Number 10, Scorpion. Yes, the two-parter that gave us the return of the Borg, not counting that piece of garbage unity, and introduced Seven of Nine. It's a good two-parter. It's at the bottom of this top 10 list because I think it has some of the biggest flaws and a lot of what it promised really didn't pay off, which was a shame because it promised a lot. They said your galaxy will be purged. It has no desire for further conflict. It only wants to return to its domain. You're welcome to stay. Put your feet up. We won't be returning to fluidic space for another day or two. That's all? The crew of Voyager suddenly find themselves facing what they had feared from the very beginning. Borg space. They locate an area devoid of Borg space and try to go through it, only to find out that it's devoid of Borg space because it's occupied by a dangerous enemy so powerful that they scare even the Borg away. Yeah, when there are places that the Borg fear to tread, it's time to get the brown uniform pants. This guy's got the right idea. Janeway decides to... An appeal to the devil. By making a peace treaty with the Borg. Yeah, that one makes sense. And yet, somehow it ends up working. Story convenience. Stage your plans. One of the good things about this episode that you'll see is a common thread in a lot of what we consider good episodes of Voyager are that they had the balls to take some chances. They were willing to swap out a main cast member and swap in a new one. They were willing to do something with a Star Trek villain that they hadn't touched in a while. Also, Chakotay actually disagreed with Janeway, which he should have been doing from the very beginning given their whole adversarial role to begin with. But for a change, Chakotay was actually saying no to Janeway until she talked to him again. It's my nature. What is this? Intra-crew conflict? Never! Scorpion was a great two-parter and one of the best episodes Voyager has to offer. Its ambition exceeded its reach a little, but hey, at least it had ambition. Then we have an agreement. Number 9. Virtuoso. Yeah, we've already covered this one as an SOS episode, but it still is one of the top 10 and for a very good reason. It's an enjoyable and awesome episode, and it's all about the Doctor. I think almost half of these are Doctor-centric episodes, and even the ones that aren't feature him a lot. Not an accident. The Doctor is probably the best character in Voyager, certainly the best character in early Voyager, and even later Voyager. Part of that's just because they refuse to allow Seven of Nine to actually have any development. Yeah. Seven, you shouldn't keep your fans waiting. Voyager encounters some aliens who are mathematically gifted, but also extremely arrogant. So, the Federation in a couple hundred years, basically. Somehow, despite being so mathematically advanced, they hear music for the first time coming from the Doctor and are amazed at the mathematical properties it contains. 
He introduces a whole new facet of culture to them, and they treat him like a living god. His fame soon goes to his head, and he is seriously considering leaving Voyager forever to placate his new fans. A whole planet of fans. I can see the appeal, I gotta be honest. Hmm. Have you ever balanced simultaneous equations? Hmm. Hey, no groupies for you! It's a character piece, and it's mostly fluff, but it still has things to say. And it has things to say about a really good character, no less. Another good thing about this episode is that it takes pains to demonstrate for us, demonstrate and not tell, how the Doctor has developed not only colleagues on Voyager, but honest-to-God friends. These people will not only miss him professionally, but personally. And when you see the reversal at the end, that's doubly driven home. Virtuoso. Because everyone needs a little miniature version of them. Still think this one was one. Yeah. The Number eight, Living Witness. Shock of all shocks, another Doctor episode. The Doctor awakes and finds out he was stolen centuries ago. He's actually the backup Doctor, not the real Doctor, but a copy nonetheless. And he watches the descendants of these aliens recreate the incident in which he was stolen, as well as just encountering Voyager and sees all the historical revision they've gone to. And it's hilarious because this is the closest we'll ever get to the Mirror Universe Voyager. And it's really awesome. We've only been attacking the Kyrian military installations. A mistake. We should target the general population. Yes, these aliens see Voyager as the bad guys. Of course, so do many Star Trek fans, but no, I'm not kidding. These are some really bad baddies. Seems some of Star Trek's best stuff is when they have, for one reason or another, their main cast acting like villains. That's always great. My name will blaze across the stars long after your petty treacheries have been forgotten. It's an interesting piece about the dangers of historical revisionism, racial tensions, and honesty in your research. But I don't appreciate seeing my people being portrayed as villains in your little simulation. And I certainly don't want your history taught to my children. And I really like at the end that, unlike, say, the Dark Knight, they decide that they're going to initiate the royal lie. The tell everyone what they want to hear because it's for the greater good. The greater good. You knew I had to use that one. And you know what? They decide not to. They say, we're going to tell the truth and it's going to be hard, but we're going to live with it. Yes! Yes! Do that! I am so sick of hearing people push this stupid royal lie garbage. If his words hold wisdom and his philosophy is honorable, what does it matter if he returns? Even though this one features the Doctor, it's not so much a character piece on the Doctor as a high concept piece. Also interesting is that in the racial tensions, Star Trek avoided making one race the pure victim race and one race the aggressor. I want him arrested and charged for the crimes we know he committed. That's not your decision to make. No, it's not, is it? I'm only on this commission because you needed a token Kyrian. Please, this isn't about race. It's always about race. Actually, I gotta say, Star Trek's pretty good about racial things. It's not good with gender dynamics and sexuality, but it's really good when it comes to racial things about saying people are imperfect and we can work our way past, not get a magic solution that solves everything. Just look at, let that be your last battlefield. I fail to see the significant difference. Interesting that they white man's burdened it, too. I, I cannot believe there was not thought put into that in the writer's room. But they don't make anything out of it. It's just a way to remind us this is an alien culture. Living Witness. Because who doesn't want to watch evil Janeway all the time? Force must be applied without apology. It's the Starfleet way. And we'll see her again later in this list. <laughs> the winner takes Number seven. Lifeline! Guess who's the star? Me? Squared! That's right. We have two Picardos in this episode because he goes to save his creator who's gotten sick and he has a special Delta Quadrant version of the cure that can actually help him. So he goes to meet his father, if you will, who looks just like him. Of course, what's great is that his father is kind of a dickhead. You're obsolete. Extinct. Yesterday's news. Now we know where it gets it from. Also, we get to see what a great professional Counselor Troy is here. <laughs> Gentlemen! Oh, spare us your psychobabble! It's a nice opportunity to revisit, well, at least one person we missed from TNG. 
Well, I suppose for some people, seeing Deanna Troy would also be nice. You're both jerks! And that Red Sparkly is actually a better counselor than Deanna Troy. Also, we see the doctor's knack for disguising himself. You! <laughs> this one really is a straight up character piece, but it's about two characters. Not just the doctor's need to solve every problem, but about Louis Zimmerman's need to be the very best. In that, you really can see the reflection of the creator in the created. I've got work to do. It can wait. Go to bed. Doctor's orders. Lifeline. Because the Cisco's can't have all the good father-son stories. We know the Picards don't. The winner takes Number six. Hope and Fear. Those poor people. This was an odd one because this was actually a season finale, but it wasn't a cliffhanger, which Voyager only did twice. However, this was a pseudo cliffhanger in the best way possible because this story ended with the man accusing Janeway of destroying his world through her actions, and at the beginning of the next episode, Night, she's sealed away and contemplating how she really has done terrible things. The you only know, downside of that episode is by the end everyone's cheering for her and convincing her she was wrong to doubt herself. No, you're right to doubt yourself. That's how you grow. No, don't develop as a character. But enough of the flaws of Night. We're talking about the good things about Open Fear. We encounter an alien who's a very jovial and friendly man who's a member of a race who's sort of a natural universal translator race, which honestly makes sense. There are people who have that knack with languages. Why not let that be a racial trait? I mean, if logic can be a racial trait, and honor, and things like that, why not a skill with languages? He helps them to decipher a message they'd received a while back, and it leads to a brand new ship called the Daedalus. Yeah, we get it. Greek mythology and all. Talk to Lionel Luther. I have no idea what you're talking about. The message promises it will get them home in three months. That's a more clever thing than they think about. Three months. What's that going to tell the genre-savvy Star Trek fan? This was the end of the season. Three months and you'll be in the Alpha Quadrant. We could start the next season with them arriving in the Alpha Quadrant and have whole new stories to tell. This would be a move forward for Voyager, and it could be exciting and cool, interesting ideas. I'd be willing to brave this void if it meant keeping you with us. They didn't follow through on that, to see my previous bitching about night, but the potential was there with this episode. I think the only thing that would improve this episode is that Arcturus, the alien translator, had shown up several episodes before and helped them with this, and that this was just the end of his storyline. We really like him, but when you learn what he's truly about, you're not nearly as surprised as you would have been if he'd been around for a few episodes. You haven't had a chance to get used to him and feel betrayed by him. You expect betrayal because he's the guest star and he's acting friendly. Yeah, when the Alien of the Week turns, you just kind of shrug and go, Oh yeah, Alien of the Week. But when the guy who's been with you for half a season reveals that he's a traitor, well, that actually gets some emotional mileage. Also, I think it's very important to realize, he has a point. Listen to this. You negotiated an agreement with the Borg Collective. You helped them defeat one of their enemies. Did it ever occur to you that there were those of us in the Delta Quadrant with a vested interest in that war? Victory would have meant annihilation of the Borg, but you couldn't see beyond the bow of your own ship. I don't blame them. They were just drones, acting with their collective instinct. You, you had a choice. He's not wrong. Again, the biggest flaw in Hope and Fear is that they dropped the ball of what it offered. Not any flaws with the episode itself. And that's why this holds the spot at number six, because... It could have been so much better if everything around it had lifted up to what it was lifting. But it was still a great tentpole episode. Hope and fear. It gave us hope that Voyager was going to change and... Uh, we feared what it would end up being. No change. Those poor people.